Amen and amen. Good morning to you all. You may have in your seats in the presence of the Lord. We'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning. And those of you that are connecting via our social media platform, we say good morning to you as well. I um, find it somewhat surprising that Elder William would use the term, um, let us receive our instructions. Because um, he must know something I don't know this morning. But we're going to go with what he has declared. I'd like to acknowledge each of you in your respective places this morning. Definitely would like to acknowledge my beautiful mom, 87 years strong. <laughs> Love you, mom. Amen. Amen. Like the old television show says, that's my mama. <laughs> also, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my wife, Lady Veronica, First Lady. God bless you. Thank you for being who you are in my life as well. I want to get right into this instruction, as Elder Williams has declared it to be. I've come to realize something, people of God, about reading the scripture, reading this Bible. I've come to conclude that some would have a tendency to read those passages of scripture that are not challenging to them. What I mean, we would cater more towards scriptures that agree with us and embrace our lifestyle and how we think and how we feel. But we are to accept and embrace the full counsel, the whole counsel of God. I've come to attribute the scripture to that of watching a Clint Eastwood Western. The Bible can be like the good, the bad, and the ugly. We don't like that one. We want to see the other Eastwood movie, Fistful of Dollars, or Two Mules for Sister Sarah. But I submit to you that the Word of God is the will of God for our lives. And this morning, I wanted to speak because this um, word, in pre preparing it, it made me think about what some parents tell their children at the time of chastisement. You know what they say. This is going to hurt me just as more as it going to hurt you. So we've gotten some hurt people here amongst us this morning. <laughs> this morning I want to speak to you about things to avoid. Things to avoid. Emphasis on things, not people. Things to avoid, according to the book of James. It is well known that the reformer and theologian Martin Luther had problems with the book of James. He called it a right stroy epistle, but it is only stroy to the degree that it is sticky. In other words, there are enough needles in this haystack, talking about the book of James, to prick the conscience of every dull, defeated, and degenerated Christian in the world. James is a right steering and stirring epistle, or a do right epistle, and it's designed to exhort and encourage to challenge and convict, 
to rebuke and revive, even to describe practical holiness and drive believers toward the goal of faith that works. The book of James is severely ethical and refreshingly practical. It is considered one of the general epistles, like the epistles of Peter, John, and Jude, in that they are not addressed to an individual church or person, but to a larger fear of believers. The teaching in these general letters complements the doctrine of Paul. Paul emphasized faith. James stressed conduct. Peter, hope. John, love, and Jude, purity. The book of James is as much a lecture as it is a letter. Though it opens with the customary salutations of an epistle, it lacks personal references common in a letter, and it has no concluding benediction. This so-called epistle was obviously prepared for public reading as a sermon to the congregations addressed. The tone of the book of James is clearly authoritative, but not autocratic. James deal with every area of a Christian's life, what he is, what he does, what he says, how he feels, and what he has. With somewhat stern teaching on practical holiness, James showed how Christian faith and Christian love should be expressed in a variety of actual situations. The book of James, my brothers and sisters, consists of five chapters. In chapter one, he encourages his readers to stand with confidence by rejoicing in diverse trials, resisting deadly temptations, and resting in divine truth. Chapter two, he highlights serving with compassion by accepting and assisting others, which is accomplished by being courteous, compassionate, and consistent with all people. Chapter three admonishes us to speak with care towards one another. But he also helps us understand that the tongue can be powerful, perverse, and even polluted. In other words, everything that comes out of our mouth isn't always edifying and wholesome. Not because it can't be. It's a reflection of the choices we make. As a result, he invites us to cultivate our thoughts by exercising a God-given wisdom that is humble, gracious, and peaceable. In essence, we are to think before we speak. The words we speak, they do one or two things. They either build up or they tear down. There is no middle ground, especially for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Every word that proceeded out of our mouth, it is, it is either going to build up the, the, the hearer or it's going to tear them down. And we make that choice when we form the thought before the word is even spoken. That's why it is beyond us to, to cry foul or oops or slippers. Slippers only apply to marbles, not relationships when we are communicating with one another. And the church said amen. amen. 
In chapter 4, James speaks about submitting with contrition. Contrition is accomplished only when we acknowledge our awareness of our own sinfulness. This awareness enables us to turn hatred into humility, humility, to turn judgment into justice and boasting into belief. In chapter 5 and the final chapter of James, he concludes with sharing with concern, particularly in the area of possessions, patience, and prayer. So this morning, people of God, in the next few minutes, I want us to hone in on a very uncomfortable chapter, chapter 4. And I pray even now that God releases over us and in us a fortitude and a grit to go inward and examine ourselves in relation to his word. And not that which will keep us stumbling in life when we interact with one another. For it is and will always be our vision to be a strong relational church. However, I submit to you that we will never accomplish this if we allow and give way to backbiting, slandering, and the tearing down of one another to run free and unchecked amongst us. So God, I pray now in the name of Jesus that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Chapter 4 of James begins with a question. Some would say that it is a rhetorical question. Verse 1 of chapter 4 in the book of James says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Before I go any further, I want the church to say hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I figure I'm going to get that out of you now because it's going to be <laughs> kind of silent as we move forward. But feel free to express your praise to God as we move forward. Amen. We, we, are, we are all adults. This is not children's ministry. What is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? Before we move forward, I think it is of importance that we see what James says prior to getting to verse 1 of chapter 4. Because in verse 13 of chapter 3, he starts there with a question by asking, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior. That's how we demonstrate our wisdom. Our wisdom is reflected, people of God, in our behavior. Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, where? Talk to me this morning. In your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. In other words, if you have, if you possess, if we 
possess harsh and cruel feelings with fiery wrath motivated by selfish ambition. He says, do not be arrogant. Don't brag about that. As children of God, this, we are not the ones to go around talking about they don't want none of this. No, we should possess this in such a way that the whole world should want what we have. Verse 15 says, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above. This wisdom that is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition and arrogance, that didn't come from God. According to the scripture, he says, this is earthly, natural. And this next one should scare all of us. It's demonic. Whether you believe it or not, we are influenced either by the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Satan. Once again, the world wants us to believe that there are shades of gray in every aspect of our life. That is not the case, people of God. Right is still right and wrong is still wrong. This wisdom did not come from above, but it's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. 1 Corinthians 3.19, Paul says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, full of mercy, glory to God, full of mercy and good fruits. It's unwavering without hypocrisy. It's unwavering meaning that it is impartial. without hypocrisy. Verse 18 says, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace. Hallelujah. By those who do what? Make peace. Now you would think, James, that's a good place to end. But no, that wasn't good enough because he turned right around and says, now what is the source of your quarrels and conflicts? In other words, what is the place of origin? We've already established that this wisdom that display or acts out with quarrels and conflicts, you didn't get that from God. That came out of the earth. So what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures? that wage war, where? In your members. Let me, let me help you. Nobody causes you to be hateful. Nobody causes you to say hurtful things. All of these people of God originates within us. There is no external factor that calls us to say and do and act or think certain ways. It originates within us. Peter or James says, the source of your pleasures that wages war in your members. So when you encounter someone and they, 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 you haven't said good morning to them and they're already being bitter and, 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 and standoffish, don't, don't trip that. That has nothing to do with you. There's a war going on within them 
and right now their face and their attitude and behavior says, I'm losing the battle. But then they want to victimize everybody that crossed their path. It is not you. And we have to stop making excuses for people. Oh, they just having a bad day. No, they just hateful. Your pleasures that wage war in your members. In other words, your desires and lusts which war against right principles and moral precepts. That's where the battle is. Paul helped us see this a little clearer over in Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, let's look at verse 19. You turn there with me if you would, because I want you to read it for yourself. Romans 7, beginning at verse 19, this is Paul as he continues from the subheading, the conflict of two natures, which begins at verse 14 in chapter 7. Paul says, for the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But sin which dwells in me, according to the scripture. He says then, I find then the principle that evil is what? present in me. Every one of us have the tendency or the propensity to be evil. Every one of us can be nasty. I find then the principle that evil is where present in me. It's not you. I'm dealing with my own issues. Still saved, but with issues. Still professing Christ, but with issues. It's evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. There's not one person under the sound of my voice that don't want to do good. But we can't be in denial, people of God, that evil lurks within us. So what we do, we find those who will only embrace our good. And if you don't agree with what I think is good about me, then I'm going to cut you loose. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Verse 22, Paul says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me <laughs> a prisoner of the law of sin. My body, my mind, bound by sin. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody getting it. making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man. Wretched man, which translate, oh, how unhappy. Oh, unhappy man. Unpleasant man. Oh, miserable man. You know, misery loves company. If I'm miserable, 
then you best believe everybody that's hanging out with me have some degree of miser miserability with them. I need to drink some water and wash that one down. In other words, they miserable too. <laughs> Unhappy man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Hold your finger right there because Romans 6, verse 6. Paul also writes under the subheading that believers are dead to sin and alive to God. He gets to verse 5, and he says, For if we have become united with him, with God, in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self, our old self, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. If that was the case, or since that is the case, why is it that sin is still lurking within us? Our old self was crucified with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died is free from sin. So Paul says in, back in Romans 7, verse 24, wretched man that I am, not you, but me. The guy that I look at in the mirror, that's where the whole problem starts. And I take this Hansel and Gretel approach when I interact with people. I drop little bread crumbs of hatred and ill will and negativity all around anywhere I go. You can tell where I've been because I left a trail. People hurt, people disgusted, people frustrated. Oh, he must have been by here. Wretched man that I am who has set me free. I behave like this because I'm in bondage. My mind, my body, they're waging war with each other. And sin is just as strong in the mind as it is in the body. And I'm losing. And I'm miserable about it. I'm unhappy. And so if you cross my path, you finna deal with a very unhappy individual. Still saved. Still blood washed. Still a person of faith, but I'm having a battle going on within myself. And it's a battle that happens one day at a time. That's why I can win today and lose tomorrow. Because I have not realized that and accepted the truth that God, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I do have authority over this flesh. I do have authority over my mind. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit within each of us that regulates our mind. But when we don't yield to his presence, then flesh you may have your alarm clock set for 6 a.m. Flesh is up at 5.59, waiting. <laughs> Trying to get an advantage on your day. Wretched man that I am who has set me free. I can't deal with you right now. I still got to work on me. From this body of death. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. 
So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand with my flesh, the law of sin. So sidebar, when we interact with one another, it's easy for us to tell what's at work within each other. It's one or two. There is no, you, you're not going to get fresh water and, 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 and bitter water from the same system. It's either the law of God or the law of sin. How do you know? Your conversation, your thoughts, and your deeds will let you know what's at work within you. Stop making excuses that so-and-so did so-and-so, and that's why I did so-and-so. No, let's eliminate all the so-and-so and let's just deal with us. I did what I did because that's what my flesh told me to do. I said what I said because that's what my flesh instructed me to say. And I'm thinking like I'm thinking because I can think that way and ain't nothing nobody can do about it. Excuse a little head neck movement, you know, because all that goes with that foolishness. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's go back over to James now. So when we look at the strife and the controversies amongst God's people, James asked the question, what is the place of origin for all of this? And we conclude that it's because of the war that is going on within us. He says, you lust and do not have, verse 2. So you commit murder. You are envious. You are envious and envious and envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You fight. You argue, and you're full of contention. Somebody say, good morning, what's so good about it? <laughs> you argue. Take note, people of God, I'm trying to help us here. Take note of people that want to argue about any and everything for no reason at all. They're trying to let you know that's a silent cry for help. Not for you to walk away from them, but for you to pray for them. Because they too are body, part of the body of Christ. But we find it easy to just abandon people, to just cast them aside. Thank God he didn't do us that way. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Okay, well, since you're telling me that, then I'm going to start asking. Paul, John, James, knowing that's going to be the natural response, he said, but you ask and, but, and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motive. Our motives give birth to our action. That's like in a criminal case. Don't nobody just go, the one thing the prosecutor tried to, do, tried to make clear to the jury is, what was their motive for murdering this person? What was the motive behind them committing this crime? What is the motive behind us not being able to love one another? It don't just happen. It's not just the way we are. There's something influencing us on the inside that's causing us to behave outwardly. Wrong motives. Then you want things, you ask God to bless you, enlarge your territory, leave your beds alone. Because you're asking for the wrong reason. James said you do it so that you can spend it on your own pleasures. What pleasures? The same one he just got through telling us about in verse 1. Because we, we are still wrestling with right principles and moral precepts. How should we conduct ourselves in this life 
that we're living. Verse 4, he says, you adulteresses. This is not the, those who are married and step outside of their marriages. This is not the adulteresses that he's speaking of here. The adulteress here are those who neglect God and their duty towards him and yield themselves to their own lust and passions. In other words, you get up in the morning, you go about your day, you ain't thought about God. You go where you want to go, you do what you want to do, you say what you want to say because you got it like that. That's the adulterer, adulterer. And he says, while you out neglecting God and doing everything that you desire, he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Friendship with the world is hostility, is hatred towards God? By now, you would think that in the body of Christ, we would have less of the world's influence and more of the kingdom. By now. The sad indictment that is not necessarily the case. There's just as much of the world's influence in many churches today than there is in the world, than it is the influence of the kingdom of God in the world. It's reversed. James says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. <coughs> he makes himself an enemy of God. Jesus said over in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and, and love the other, or either you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. In other words, he's not just talking about money, people of God, but anything that personifies our worship over God. Anything or anyone. Then he gets to verse 5. He says, or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn there with me. Hold your finger there in James. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul addresses the very same thing in verse 19. He says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple, not the temple, but a temple of the Holy Spirit, which says the Holy Spirit resides within every believer, every born again child of God, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You're not the only one that have the Holy Spirit. Everybody else that has accepted Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary's cross, they have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, living within them. Even, with, even though you reject them, it does not negate that the Holy Spirit is still within them. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is where? In you. Whom you have from God and that you are not your own. But that's what the world teaches us, self-preservation. Get all you can get for yourself. You've been brought with a price. Therefore, we all are to glorify God in our body. Do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? 
He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Verse 6 says, but he gives a greater grace. God gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is. Present tense. Right now, today, God is, was, still is, and will always be opposed to the proud. God has set himself in opposition to the proud. And that's not going to change. But he gives grace, he gives favor to the humble. And the world will have you to believe to be humble in this day and time says that you are a weak individual. I submit to you this morning, it's more grace upon that individual's life than those who are out trying to impress people. Verse 7, James says, submit, therefore, to God. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, that sounds too easy. Submit, humble yourself to God. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. God has already predetermined when you would be exalted. You don't have to make nothing happen. You don't have to manufacture anything. It's God that's doing it. He's already predetermined what he's going to do in each and every one of our lives. But what he wants us to do is to humble ourselves. <clears throat> Resist the devil. Stand against him. Well, then, word or deed. When I was preparing this study, I was reminded of in 1969, there was a song that was pretty popular. It was by an artist by the name of Joe May. And Joe's song was, Don't Let the Devil Ride. So for your listening pleasure, I took the opportunity to at least write the lyrics, not to sing it to you. <laughs> he said, don't let the devil ride. If you let him ride, he'll want to drive. Don't let him ride. Don't let him hold your hand. Because if he holds your hand, he'll want you to join his band. Don't let him ride. Don't let him flag you down. Y'all right. right. know that was real popular back in the 60s. <laughs> Don't let him flag you down. If he flags you down, he'll turn your soul around. Two more. He says, don't let him be your boss. Because if he be your boss, your soul will be lost. And lastly, and this one I really want us to grab hold to, is say, don't let him talk to you. If he talks to you, he'll tell you what to do. So don't let the devil ride. And the church said, amen. amen. That's why once upon a time when it came down to testimony service, we had to stop that because you wasn't, we weren't sure what you was going to hear. <laughs> yeah, I was home this week and the devil was so busy. He told me, whoa. When we know better, we do better. Amen. Amen. James says, submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. He will. That's a definite article. He will. But you can't talk to him. You can't give him, a, give him no ride. You can't let him flag you down. Don't be distracted. Now, just in case you didn't know, 
He has retired that red cape in the pit for. That ain't how he rolling today. <laughs> he looked just like you and me. Resist him. And he will flee from you. In other words, when people begin to say certain things to you, you can check it right then. You know right then if it's of God or if it's not of God. You know the wisdom that comes out of their mouth. If it's edifying and if it's uplifting and if it's for building up someone, receive that. But if it's to the contrary of that, they're trying to tell you who their daddy is. Flee from that. Stand against that. Stop letting people think that it's okay for them to say and do anything in your presence and still profess to be a child of God and you don't say nothing about it. <laughs> Silence is compliance. And the church said amen. amen. Then he says, draw near to God. And he would draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he would draw near to you. This drawing people of God has to do with our worship and our reverence to God. It's not taking two steps this way and say, boy, God, I'm closer now. No, that's not the drawing near. It has everything to do with the genuineness of our heart and the reverence of our heart in our worship to God. That's how we draw near to him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we draw near to God through our worship, and in return, he draws near to us. Okay, three people said amen. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. You draw near to God, and he draws near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. This is like a ceremonial cleansing, and you were being cleansed, cleansed from guilt and the pollution of sin. We know sin left a stain on all of our lives. Paul says we were, we were born in sin. David says, excuse me, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. How can now we act like we don't know what sin is? The problem is we have become so familiar with it until it shapes some of our character and our behavior. And we think that's just the way I am. No, that's sin. Draw near to God, cleanse your hands, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The same double-minded he was talking about over in chapter 1, when he says, and, and, and he that's double-minded, let not that man think he will receive anything from God. It's there in the Scripture. Verse 9. Okay, time. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. This, my brothers and sisters, is an act of contrition. Turn with me over to Psalms 51. I believe this is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture, Scripture, where one has made clear to God that I am aware of my own sinfulness. And God, I'm letting you know that I know that I'm aware. Okay, that's Isaiah. I'm looking for Psalms. Hallelujah. Psalms 51. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 51. David says, after Nathan the prophet had came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, he says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He ain't called Bathsheba name yet. He says, for I know my transgressions. See, that's when you know you're grown, when you can talk to God like this. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He says, behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop. Hallelujah. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, hallelujah, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. David acknowledging he knew all the battles that he had been in and all the lies that he had taken. And that's a good example, people of God, because the things that we've done in life, we try to exercise this Napoleon Hill, this positive mental attitude to think that if I think hard enough about what I don't want to think about, it'll go away. I'm sorry. That's not how it works. No psychologist, psychologist or clinician, mental health clinician is going to tell you about the Word of God in this degree. The contrition first starts with the awareness that I am a sinful individual. And God, because I acknowledge this, I'm laying everything out before you, withholding nothing. I'm withholding nothing. God, you know everything that nobody else know. You seen what nobody else seen, and you, know, you heard what nobody else heard. But God, I know you know, and I need to empty myself, not try to cover it up with positive thinking. That's what helps us grow in the things of God. We get Romans mixed up when we confess and believe, but it don't start there. That just puts us on the right track. The relationship says, God, my mind has a tendency to take me back to places that I don't want to go. See, God, I've done some wrong things. I've hurt some people. I'm not proud of everything that I've done. And because nobody here knows what I've done, God, I'm still battling with my own past. But I can't let anybody else know about that because then, God, they may push me aside. They may not want anything to do with me. They'll take away my HO card and I can't hang out no more. David says, this is done through deliverance. Through deliverance. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. 
Oh, Lord, open my lips. Hallelujah. That my mouth may declare your praise. That's why, people of God, you don't understand why it's so hard when we congregate for somebody, for everybody to open their mouth and say, God, I love you. God, I thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's not that easy for some of us because we are contending with the guiltiness of our past. But when we surrender to God, as the psalmist says, God, you open my lips. I don't want me to do it because if I open it, ain't nothing going to come out. You open it that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, God, I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. Verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. God, we all are broken before you. We all acknowledge in this moment that we have an awareness of our sinfulness. And God, according to your word, you said you would not despise us. But you didn't say man would. But you say you would not despise us. You would not throw us away because we're not perfect. You would not abandon us because I still have thoughts that are not always pleasing in your sight. I still have a tendency to say some things because I don't know that what I'm saying can be so hurtful, but then, God, I do know. So I find myself acknowledging, God, what I want to do, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I find myself doing. I'm so unhappy. My smile does not constitute happiness. Because I'm hurting inside. Singing, but hurting. Preaching, but hurting. Ushering, but hurting. Serving, but hurting. God, I want to open my mouth with praise on my lips. I want to lift my hands without wrath. I want to be able to look unto you and say, God, I love you because you first loved me. I want to praise and worship you, God, as if there's nobody in this place but you and me. Hallelujah. A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, you would not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. When we let God know, people of God, that I am broken, I do the best to put on my best when I come to congregate and to assemble here. But God, there are some realities that awaits me when I leave this place. Some realities that I can't even speak about. I'm still dealing, oh God, with repercussions of past decisions. Unforgiveness. At the end of the day, God, what I'm simply trying to say is, I'm dealing with me. I'm dealing with me. And I submit to you, people of God, that God says, when we take him at his word, he'll raise us up. But it starts with humility. We have to be willing to say, God, first of all, I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. It's not his fault, his fault, or her fault. 
Nobody made me say or do anything. That was my decision. And I take ownership to my decision. And I ask now that you forgive me, that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Give you these last one and a half verses because now it's 12 o'clock and the other Clint Eastwood movie was High Plains Drifter. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. People of God, it's the lowly one that becomes the lifted one. Humility comes before honor. And the last thing he said, 11a, do not speak against one another. That's the word of God for the people of God. Why don't you stand with me? Lord, we love you. Sometimes, God, your word can be like a bitter pill for those of us from days of old. It's kind of like castor oil. I don't even think this generation know what castor oil is. <laughs> but as, as many of you that can reach and grab a hand that's close to you, just make sure you grab touch with somebody agree with somebody hallelujah father god in the name of jesus we are here god because of your grace and your mercy it's because of your grace that we have not been consumed but god in this moment we are acknowledging that i'm no different than the person whose hand I'm holding. Because at the end of the day, God, better yet, at the beginning of each day, I, just like them, are in need of a Savior. So I thank you, God, that even in my brokenness, you still find beauty. Even in my contrition, you still find the reason to not forsake me. I thank you, God, for the person whose hand I'm holding. You squeeze that hand gently, please. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for this person now whose hand I'm holding. To let them know that their past is just that, their past. For according to your word, God, you say, as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. I speak wholeness now. Over every heart. wholeness in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you strengthen each and every one of us, that we may be the people that you have created and called us to be, that we may be that light that is set on a hill in the blessed name of Jesus. I squeeze that hand one more time. Father, I pray even the more that every need is being met now for this person named hand that I'm holding. God, I, I desire more for them than I do for myself. And because I know your grace is sufficient, bestow upon each and every one of them, God, the grace that they are so in need of. 
We thank you, God, because according to your word, there is no condemnation. Hallelujah. To them that are in Christ Jesus. So, Father, I pray that this word illuminate their heart in such a way that they too, just like myself, will fall on their knees and declare that, God, you are great and greatly to be praised. I pray even the more, God, that the very words of my mouth, God, I can't go back and take one word back that I've already spoken. I can't unspeak what's been spoken. I got, God, I can't even unthink what's been thought. I can't unfeel what I've already felt. But what I do ask in the matchless name of your Son and our Savior, that you let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are and will always be our Redeemer, our strength, our peace. For we are complete in you. So build us up, God, in our most holy faith, in you and in you alone. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. I speak forgiveness over every person under the sound of my voice. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Because of the shed blood of Jesus, Thank you, Lord. Now teach us, God, how to walk in a manner that is pleasing to you. Teach us how to love the way that you love us unconditionally. May we too be full of mercy one towards the other. Because the law of reciprocity is always at work, God. We reap what we sow. My God. So God, receive our surrender. Thank you for restoration in the hearts and lives of your people. Cause our eyes to be enlightened so that we can see according to your word the things that we should avoid in this world. In Jesus' name, in the household of faith, said amen. 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 Again, glory to God. Glory to God. Uh, as we take our seats, let us prepare to return and honor God with our tithes and offerings. And while we are making preparation to do that, I want to make you aware of a special announcement that on Sunday, Sunday coming.